Hello and welcome to a special COVID-19 edition of the Fellowship Lecture Series. My name is Heidi Leftwich, I'm the Vice Chair of the SMS SMFM Education Committee, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on demand. Following the lecture, we're going to have a brief Q&A discussion, so please enter your questions in the Q&A portion of the webinar. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Tori Halscott. Dr. Halscott is an assistant professor in maternal fetal medicine at the Johns Hopkins University Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics. He completed his maternal fetal medicine fellowship from the University of Arizona College of Medicine and from MedStar Georgetown University Hospital, as well as an additional critical care fellowship um, at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's given many lectures on critical care obstetrics and is um, nationally known for not only his expertise, but on a more personal level for his dedication to education, wellness, and family. It's an honor and a privilege to introduce Dr. Tori Halscott. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leffert. That was very kind. I appreciate it. I'll do my best to live up to that. All right. Howdy to all the fellows and everyone watching. Um, you know, the obligatory, we've got a lot to cover, so we'll try and get through this pretty quick because I do want to have some time for questions, but my email will be at the very end as well, so feel free to reach out with any questions. So I have no disclosures. Objectives, I think we know what these are going to be. You're going to try and learn a little bit more about COVID and maybe some updates, some things new, um, and a, a focus on the critical care aspects and recognizing critically ill patients towards the end of the discussion today. The disease severity of we have to classify who has COVID and what that COVID looks like. So after the diagnosis, whether they present or whether they're asymptomatic and we find out on admission, classifying who is uh, potentially going to get worse uh, is important, obviously. And that worsening tends to happen within those first few days, three to seven days on average for most of these patients. I won't belabor this because I think we're pretty familiar with this, a lot of us at this point in time, but it, it follows kind of a logical progression. Symptomatic is mild, moderate is symptomatic that also is requiring some further interventions uh, and some lessening of symptoms are not able to be achieved with kind of your over-the-counter medicines or you need a little bit more supplemental oxygen to improve their saturation. Mild and moderate outpatient therapies that are available are a couple antibody cocktails and some monoclonal antibodies, all of which I will not try to pronounce, uh, but if anybody can, kudos to you. But these are available for patients who are outpatient. So these are people not requiring admission. They haven't reached that level of severity yet. And there may be some evidence that, that may be appropriate for those patients. As far as the, the straightforward efficacy, it's a little bit less clear, I think, from some of the research currently. However, pregnant patients should not be precluded from getting these medications if otherwise they would be a candidate. Uh, and having those discussions with them is absolutely appropriate. Some of the things to review just quickly, and, and one way to determine if a patient is sicker than they may initially appear, because remember our patients are young and healthy until they're not, is the ABG uh, parameters between a non-pregnant and a normal pregnant patient. So normal pregnancy is a compensated respiratory alkalosis. So if we see a patient who has a normal or a high normal PCO2, which is the third parameter there, that's actually concerning in a pregnant patient because that tends to be typically low and the bicarbonate mirrors that as well because it's a chronic state in pregnancy. So if a patient presents to the ED and they have a quote unquote normal arterial blood gas, but they're breathing quickly, they might actually be retaining CO2 and have impending respiratory failure, either due to COVID or some other respiratory process. Asthma, we'll see this additionally as well. So it's very helpful for us to be mindful of this and help translate for our colleagues. So keep that in mind. You don't need to remember all the numbers. Just remember that pregnancy is a compensated respiratory alkalosis. The pH should be slightly higher than normal. And the PCO2 and the bicarbonate, which are two sides of the same coin, should be lower than normal. Along those lines too, as far as quick assessments for patients, the QSOFA score, which has been discussed in some of the SMFM and I believe the ACOG practice bulletins in regards to identifying critically ill patients, I support that as well mostly because it's simple, straightforward, and it's been validated in a different uh, population than pregnant patients. However, to extrapolate to pregnant patients is not unreasonable because it's a screening tool. It's not a diagnostic tool. And it gives you an idea of who may be more sick and who may need some more interventions. Again, you don't need to remember the parameters. Just remember the uh, kind of categories. So what their blood pressure is. Obviously, someone with a low blood pressure, low systolic blood pressure is probably sick. Someone with a high respiratory rate is probably sick. And this tends to be more of a subjective. If someone's breathing 24 times a minute, they tend not to look like they're actually gasping for air and actually looking that sick. Someone who's breathing 30 to 40 times a minute is easy to see from across the room. 
and those are the patients that usually have a worsening respiratory status and someone who just has a slightly increased respiratory rate. And altered mental status, so basically any confusion, even a patient can't tell you where, where they are, what the day of the week is, what month it is, those sort of mild levels of confusion will factor into the QSOFA as a point for altered mental status. And the more points you have, as with most screening tools in these tables, the worse the prognosis. So keep that in the back of your mind. Severe disease and critical disease are kind of things we'll focus on for today and the things that are more challenging to treat. So obviously the symptoms get worse. You do have a high respiratory rate and 30 breaths a minute is usually easy to see. Um, hypoxia despite supplemental oxygen. And this is the trigger we're using for a lot of our inpatients, whether pregnant or not, and the patients I'm taking care of in the ICU and the intermediate level. Um, this is one of the main criteria we utilize to bring them to a higher level of care is this hypoxia despite supplemental oxygen. The PF ratio, again, not something from an MFM standpoint that you need to commit to memory, I would say, but it's a good idea to understand what's behind it. It's the partial pressure of oxygen, so the oxygen dissolved in the blood after the hemoglobin has bound all the free oxygen, divided by the fraction of inspired oxygen, which 100% being the max. So if your PaO2 is low, despite giving you all the oxygen we can, that's obviously bad. And that's what the PF ratio tells us. And as that number gets lower, and less than 100 is very severe ARDS, 100 or 200 is, is moderate ARDS, and 200 or 300 is what we call mild ARDS, but all of them are bad. Um, and those are things that we utilize to triage as well as uh, change our interventions for critically ill patients. And the 50% lung involvement on imaging, relatively subjective. However, I'm sure most of you have seen different x-rays from different COVID patients over the course of the past year and can see when certainly there's greater involvement than other areas. This is just a uh, picture of what that may look like. The top left is not bad, but you do have that peripheral viral pneumonia appearance to that x-ray. And then as you go to the right, top right and bottom right, you definitely see more diffuse infiltrates, also consistent with viral distribution. However, that's what a more severe picture from the radiology standpoint, a greater than 50% involvement standpoint on chest x-ray for a COVID patient may look like. Similar findings on a CT scan. You can see the top left is pretty normal appearing lungs, that nice dark area to the parenchyma. As you get to the bottom left and the top right, those have a little bit different distribution of some what we call ground glass opacities, areas of inflammation or congestion. And then the bottom right also has those and that can be a more prolonged sort of appearance uh, as well. And then we get to a, a more worsening of disease where certainly it looks like greater than 50% of the lungs are involved and rather diffuse inflammation, infiltration could be consistent with viral pneumonias, uh, including COVID pneumonia, absolutely. This is what I talked about for ARDS, this is what we call the Berlin criteria. And we have your PF, uh, PAO2 to FIO2 ratios and the associated mortalities with those. And as you see, with severe ARDS, a PF ratio less than 100, the mortality is almost 50%. Now, again, this is not in pregnant patients. These are in ICU patients, and most of the time, mixed unit medicine surgery ICU patients. However, if you can't ventilate well, obviously, that increases uh, significant risk for mortality, and that probably is true to a degree, maybe not up to 50%, but to a degree for pregnant patients as well. So some of the therapies for severe COVID, I think we've all become very accustomed to a lot of these, certainly in the ICU, we have steroids uh, and dexamethasone specifically is what we're using consistently here. And the trials that have looked at this have shown about a third reduction in mortality. So obviously a powerful weapon in the armamentarium to treat COVID-19 and continuing to utilize that hopefully will uh, give a mortality benefit as we get near, ideally towards the end of the pandemic, hopefully as vaccinations become more widespread. There's been discussion of hydrocortisone and methylprednisone as well, not only in the obstetrical world, but outside of that. Um, and studies have looked into the efficacy of this. The idea from a pregnancy standpoint is they're non-fluorinated corticosteroids and they may not have the same concern for risks uh, as some of the historical discussions with that dexamethasone. But the survival benefit hasn't been shown with these specific medications as opposed to dexamethasone. And here we have a forest plot looking at that. Um, you can see dexamethasone is at the top. The recovery trial is driving most of the waiting for that um, fixed subgroup fix effect. And then you have hydrocortisone and methylprednisone below, which are smaller studies and less numerous. Mm -hmm. But overall, there's a benefit apparently for steroids and dexamethasone is the driver of that in these uh, meta-analyses.
This is looking at subgroup analysis for other outcomes and for mechanical ventilation, need of pressors um, uh, and symptomatic benefit and also showing the same thing that there are improvements with steroid use. So I would say liberally use those as needed for your patients who are admitted for COVID-19. Additionally, there's uh, remdesivir and other antivirals, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, interferon has gotten some more traction lately as far as discussion. However, benefits of these are less clear cut. Um, so it's not that they can be utilized for patients that they're appropriate for. Mm -hmm. However, having that discussion for a patient uh, as well as the demonstrated efficacy for some of these things or lack of efficacy for some of these things needs to be part of that counseling. Remdesivir is commonly utilized at our institutions um, as well. It may or may not be commonly utilized at all institutions. Um, and that's an institution level discussion to have. But if a pregnant patient is a candidate for it, also it should not be withheld due to pregnancy status. Some of the antibodies we've utilized, tocilizumab was more prominently employed at our institution earlier in the pandemic. And for some time, we we're utilizing less of it. Some of that was due to availability, um, candidacy based on some of the research and the trials, but there is now a more of a option to utilize that for some patients as indicated. And also that is available for pregnant patients as uh, if they meet criteria additionally, as well as convalescent plasma with the same rationale. Safety data is not certainly robust for use in pregnancy. However, there's definitely been descriptions of convalescent plasma and these other antibodies utilized and significant adverse effects have not been related. So again, having those discussions with patients weighing the risks and benefits um, is an appropriate discussion to have and these, patients, these medicines can be utilized as needed. I'll get to description of more of these in the next slide, but just kind of give you an idea of the supplemental oxygen strategies and mainstay of treating symptomatic COVID, uh, despite medications as well. Obviously, we need to make sure the ventilation is all right. And what these look like, uh, you probably have seen them, probably familiar with them. I'm not sure if you guys can see my pointer, but on the far left is a traditional nasal cannula typically two to 15 liters um, via wall supply. Doesn't provide a lot of pressure because it's a small caliber of tubing, but it can provide almost up to 100% oxygen at those prongs, um, but it doesn't provide as much pressure as some of the other things. So the oxygenation may not be ideal still with that. If you utilize this traditional nasal cannula and you can't get a saturation that is appropriate for your patient, then the next step up is the non-rebreather mask on the top of the next two or a Venturi mask below that. They work similarly. Venturi mask has a difference. These different colored nozzles are for different fractions of inspired oxygen up to a max of 60%. And the idea with the Venturi mask is that the nozzles direct airflow in a more laminar, more efficient method to deliver it uh, to the upper airway and, and be diffused and ventilated um, potentially more beneficially than a non-rebreather face mask. Not tremendous data that says that that's true. Um, however, if a patient is not oxygenating well or looks like they're having an increased work of breathing or struggling to breathe with a non-rebreather face mask, it's absolutely appropriate to try a Venturi face mask or vice versa and see which one works better and they may be more comfortable with. The next, next ex escalation is uh, the non-rebreather, um, sorry, um, high flow nasal cannula, which is similar in design to the traditional nasal cannula, but it's a larger caliber tube and can deliver a lot more volume and a 100% fraction of inspired oxygen up to 60 liters per minute. And because of that rapid flow of volume, it does create some positive pressure in the airway, about five or so, uh, which is similar to your traditional beginning CPAP. Um, so that is a next step option. And a lot of our patients kind of anecdotally have been able to be maintained on that and done well for several days until being able to wean from it. So we do see a lot of our hospitalized patients on the high flow nasal cannula, uh, at least in the intermediate care and the ICU level. And then the step up from there prior to invasive uh, ventilation, which is intubation, is the face mask that utilizes either BiPAP or CPAP. CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. BiPAP, bi-level positive airway pressure, where you have a certain pressure with the breath in and a lower pressure with the breath out. Um, either or is fine. It's typically just utilizing whichever is available and whichever the patient can tolerate. Uh, BiPAP can have higher pressures usually than CPAP but it's also a good option. That's kind of the general escalation of supplemental oxygen therapies throughout the course of severe COVID. Prone positioning has also come to the forefront and something we've been doing for some time in the ICU world, but has become much more prominent in the, the discussion outside of the ICU because of uh, COVID. 
a good thing to know about. Uh, most of the time, it's in your non-intubated patients. Um, you can do passive proning, where you're moving them around or they're rolling, you know, side to side on their own. A lot of them will, you know, be uh, on their stomach for extended periods of time and then on their side for a few hours each as well. There's no great kind of protocol for passive proning, so we typically discuss it with the patient and instruct them to move as comfortable. Intubated patients, it's a little bit different uh, based on trial data. This is up to 18 hours a day where we do place them on their stomach while they're intubated. That's just kind of what that looks like. So your supine and your cone patients, those can be passive, so not intubated or intubated patients. Those are the typical positions we'll have for those. Passive proning, the recumbent positions, um, it's for non-intubated patients. It's not that necessarily you couldn't do it, hasn't really been looked at in the trials, that positioning. So we tend not to do that, um, but it could be feasible. But in general, if a patient is that sick that their intubator needs to be prone, we typically try to keep them fully prone as long as we can to help that distribution of ventilation. This is from a paper in the Green Journal a few months ago from our colleagues at Baylor uh, and looking at prone positioning in the awake patient in a pregnant patient and how to demonstrate to accomplish that. And you can see lots of pillows making the patient comfortable. We also do that in non-pregnant patients. We do uh, lots of pillows or padding and pressure points because you don't want to have a patient prone for extended period of time and have not only discomfort, but pressure ulcers that result. From the same authors, this is prone positioning for the intubated patient. And you have a proning team that helps set up the bed as well as mobilize the patient. Of utmost importance is having respiratory therapy or anesthesiology or whomever, making sure the tube is secured, the endotracheal tube, and that it does not become dislodged um, and that the patient is ventilating well after being proned. If you put them in the prone position and their ventilation becomes significantly worse all of a sudden, the right thing to do is unprone them and inspect the endotracheal tube. So I would say, for our pregnant patients or any patients, when they're being proned, there should be someone who can manage an airway that is readily at hand. This is believed to be the benefit with proning. As you're moving these patients uh, and changing the position, you're helping different alveoli open up and you're increasing ventilation and perfusion to different areas of the lungs and helping move some of that inflammation out as well as increase aeration. You can see the schematic on the left demonstrating that as well as CT findings on the right of a patient who's been proned and unproned several times. Critical disease obviously represents an extension from severe disease, and this is typically respiratory failure that requires mechanical ventilation with intubation. If they have multi-organ dysfunction or failure, which doesn't always coincide with vent, uh, intubation and ventilation, but often does, or shock, typically in the ICU world, we refer to as MAP less than 65. Other definitions include systolic less than 90. Um, refractory hypotension, despite some measures to improve it, or um, end organ hypoperfusion. This is from our initial SMFM statement. This is the algorithm. I won't belabor this. I bring this up just to remember it exists and feel free to utilize it not only for COVID patients, but we tried to write this in such a way that it could be applicable to assessing other potentially critically ill patients as well. Critical disease still remains largely supportive. Mechanical ventilation, as well as other uh, methods to increase aeration and ventilation are the mainstay of therapy. The survival benefit with dexamethasone specifically, and corticosteroids in general, as we discussed, six milligrams daily for 10 days. That can be IV or oral. Um, so if a patient was admitted and doing poorly, but then significantly improved, and they still have a few days left, but they're able to be moved to a regular floor, even discharged home, they can continue on oral steroids to complete a 10-day course. Again, pregnancy is not a contraindication of therapy. I think we know that well, but part of our job is to advocate for our patients and explain to our colleagues um, that may not know those things as well, uh, that it's not a reason to preclude these patients getting treatment that may help improve their uh, function as well as save their life. Additionally, if there are uh, potential trials at an institution or compassionate use, those things also should be on the table for pregnant patients and having those discussions as needed and asking those questions of our colleagues. Are there other things that maybe are being trialed at this institution we can utilize for this patient? And again, SMFM advocates, and I advocate personally as well, inclusion of pregnant patients in ongoing trials and ongoing therapies in general um, and having that appropriate discussion with these patients. Refractory hypoxemia is a concept that we may not be as familiar with in the OB and the MFM world. It's something we see and treat in the ICU world consistently. Uh, and we saw a lot of it 
via COVID. That's the mainstay of the patients I take care of in the ICU and my other intensivist colleagues that rise to that level. Uh, it's because despite our best efforts, we're having trouble oxygenating them. There's not a great kind of definition for this. It's kind of one of those things I know it when I see it type of thing, but if we've escalated care and we're not able to get an adequate oxygenation, that falls in that category. So there's been some definitions that have been offered. Um, again, you don't have to memorize these, but you can remember going back to the discussion of very bad ARDS, if you can't have a partial pressure of oxygen, a PO2 greater than 60 or so, and you're giving 100% oxygen, that's really bad. And that's consistent with our refractory hypoxemia from any modality of supplemental oxygen. The things we do to optimize ventilation that can hopefully uh, preclude it being refractory are increasing the positive end expiratory pressure to help keep the alveoli open and encourage ventilation and gas exchange, particularly of carbon dioxide, prone positioning as we've discussed, Neuromuscular blockade, which colloquially paralytics are paralyzing the patient. I would say I would advocate caution util utilizing that term, especially with a patient's family or a patient's loved one around, because they may not understand that's a temporary thing. Um, we can use that word with each other, but neuromuscular blockade is a more appropriate term. And inhaled therapies like nitric oxide. This is from the updated bulletin and showing just kind of a flow chart for how we approach refractory hypoxemia, it really in general in the ICU, but specifically for COVID, Dr. Vaught and myself kind of co-opted this uh, and, and made some tweaks of how we would uh, have this work with a pregnant patient as well. So that first green diamond you see talks about those adjunct maneuvers to increase ventilation, your prone positioning, your appropriate PEEP, and this is per ARDSNET protocol, which is, was a large trial, you don't need to memorize the protocol uh, aspects. There are tables you can download readily and easily and utilize. It's pretty, pretty simple and straightforward. Just remember ARDSNET is a thing and it exists and feel empowered for our patients who are in the ICU to ask our colleagues, are we managing her ventilation via ARDSNET? Um, and ideally we should be. Neuromuscular blockade as indicated as well. That's been shown to be helpful for some patients. If you've done all those things and they still have a poor oxygenation or a poor PF ratio, they have refractory hypoxemia. The next step we do a lot of times is this inhaled vasodilators. And we'll talk about that momentarily. If you get improvement with that, fantastic. You can continue on those measures and try and wean those as needed and try and kind of walk them down. We call liberating them from the vent, decreasing the support and seeing how they do on their own. That can take time, especially can take a lot of time in our COVID patients. And unfortunately, some of our COVID patients, kind of the long haul COVID patients, we see that in the acute setting as well and they'll have convalesce from a COVID standpoint, but have lungs that are so damaged they need to remain intubated for an extended period of time or an indefinite period of time. If they, however, have not improved with those additional measures and they're at 32 weeks or greater of gestation, we advocated discussion of a controlled delivery. Not necessarily that is a trigger for delivery, but having that discussion with our ICU colleagues, having that discussion with ourselves to say, how do we control this setting can get a neonate delivered in a safe fashion and have a benefit for that little one or little ones um, and also uh, simplify that uh, you know planning um, I would not say simplify the equation it's not just do a c-section just do a delivery which we may have those discussions with our colleagues we need to weigh all the pros and cons however after 32 weeks the benefits of remaining in utero for a fetus are diminishing there are still some absolutely but it's a different situation than a 24 or 26 weeker, as we know. If we're below 32 weeks, because of that ongoing benefit for the neonate, consideration of ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, is part of the algorithm that we would um, entrain as well. So neuromuscular blockade, as we said, colloquially known as paralytics. This has been shown to be helpful for patients in moderate to severe ADS, especially if used early. So if you have a patient who is pregnant or postpartum who's in the ICU with COVID and you're having difficulty ventilating them, they may ask, can we use paralytics for this patient? The answer is absolutely yes. Not only they can, if they think they need to, they should. There has been shown to be a benefit. It can be done continuously or intermittently. Personally, I've had success giving patients one or two doses uh, and that has sometimes been enough to help their lungs be open enough for enough time that then they don't need further paralytics after that. Some patients do need extended paralytics and I personally have patients on paralytics for many days or weeks. Uh, you just have to see how they do and what maneuvers you can do to wean them from the ventilator. Those are some of the examples, cis atracurium, rocuronium, vecuronium, the ones we commonly use. All those are, are able to be utilized in pregnancy as well. And we have to make sure the treatment is working. Typically we use a peripheral nerve stimulator, which we'll colloquially call a twitch monitor. 
Uh, basically, if a paralytic is working and you hook up this peripheral stimulator, it's like a, a TENS unit and it causes muscle spasms and stimulation. If you have adequate uh, blockade with electrical stimulation, you should not have that twitching. So that's how we typically see if this is working. And our ICU colleagues and our ICU nurses are uh, commonly utilizing these devices, so they're very familiar with their use. Again, also safe in pregnancy. Pulmonary vasodilators that we've employed, inhaled nitric oxide, um, utilized commonly for very refractory patients. Survival benefit, ventilation benefits, other things are less clear cut in the data. However, they can be utilized as needed. Um, there's not typically a downside to them in general. Um, not contraindicated in pregnancy because this is a gas that is inhaled in the lungs and broken down quickly. Um, but the effects of this do tend to wane after a couple days. So it is on the table for our patients. Um, it is not, unfortunately, a magic bullet most of the time. Epoprostenol, which is inhaled prostacyclin, also works similarly. Um, there can be significant hypotension with this medication, though, in about one out of every five patients. So we need to be cognizant of that. But again, not contraindication, not contraindicated for pregnant and postpartum patients as well, although there is not robust data. You know, the general algorithm you should think is if, if the patient might not survive this, I should try some things and see, you know, if I can get a benefit and help the patient survive. And that uh, survival of the mother often engenders survival of the fetus and the neonate. So having that discussion with our colleagues is of paramount importance um, and a fear of what this may or may not do to a pregnant or a breastfeeding lactating patient um, needs to have be part of the discussion, but may need to take a back seat to survival of the patient. As we stated a little bit uh, earlier, these medications are great. However, a evidence-based benefit has yet to be shown. So they're available, but we should not expect them to cure the patient, unfortunately. ECMO is something that uh, we've all heard of, uh, something we do in the ICU, honestly, relatively uncommonly, unless it's a CV ICU, but even then it's not all the patients, it's still a, a minority of patients, but what this does is artificially performs the lung function and sometimes the cardiac function, depending on which ECMO you're utilizing. VV, venovenous, is for support of the lungs by themselves. VA ECMO is for support of the heart in addition to the lungs. So it depends on what organ systems are failing for your patient and what support that they need um, to utilize, which is appropriate. It requires significant labor, significant coordination, significant ongoing care. So I would strongly caution to not have those discussions of just put them on ECMO. Uh, it's kind of the you know, third or fourth degree past the just do a C-section discussion. I would also caution against that. Having a discussion of what are the risks and benefits? And does this patient meet criteria? Does this patient need it? Will this patient benefit from it? And especially in the pregnant or postpartum patient, there'll be additional questions to ask about feasibility. This schematics looking at how we place ECMO and it can be as straightforward as these and can be much more complicated as well, depending on multi-cannulation sites. In A and B, you've got VV ECMO and you've got a couple entry you know, um, drain and return sites. So you have the internal jugular, you've got the femoral, uh, and obviously the femoral placement could be challenging in a pregnant or recently postpartum patient because of the gravid uterus. And that's a discussion to have with our colleagues. When we place a patient on ECMO, the, it's a circuit that the blood has to flow through. If there's an impediment to that flow from the gravid uterus or from a postpartum uterus um, or from a bowel minor, those sort of things, those are discussions to have. Those are not necessarily absolute preclusions to use of ECMO, but we have to go into it knowing that we may have some issues achieving a flow that we need. And if we're not able to achieve a flow we need, then the benefit of it may be precluded too. But unfortunately, it's one of those things you don't know till you try. And there can be lots of other reasons why you have flow issues um, within the circuit itself. But that's something for our ECMO team and our ECMO colleagues to then troubleshoot on there and fix as needed. But as you can see, you go down to the bottom right, that's a three cannulation ECMO circuit VVA, VVA ECMO, um, and these can be very complicated and have multiple units running at a time. So that uh, can make it a much more labor intensive uh, challenge as well as coordination of care for such patients, whether they're pregnant or otherwise. As we were saying, the team required to do ECMO is not just the ICU. Um, often we as intensivists are managing the patient in the ICU, but we're utilizing a very vast and robust team approach to accomplish that. Cardiac or cardiothoracic surgery is often people placing the cannulas. Cardiology is often following these patients are getting 
many echoes a day, uh, in many instances. Obviously, critical care, these patients are housed in an ICU. Anesthesia, um, in addition to the intensivist, if the intensivist doesn't intubate or manage, you know, airway things as well. Um, so, but having anesthesia on hand as far as uh, further paralytic adjuncts as needed is also a very valuable if that's not part of the intensivist scope of practice themselves. The perfusionist is who actually runs the circuit uh, from a tech standpoint and extremely important. Uh, and they're often there 24 hours a day. There's several of them and they will rotate through. So to make sure that things are working appropriately and that the circuit's not clotting off because that can be life-threatening. Obviously our nursing colleagues and in the ICU in higher levels of care, one of the main important things about a higher level of care is the nursing ratio. So in an ICU is typically one to one, one nurse to one very sick patient. An ECMO patient sometimes have two nurses for that patient. That's how much work is involved. Um, so making sure that we're able to support them and have them be able to do the things they need for these extremely labor intensive patients uh, it requires a lot too. Blood bank, because often these patients do require ongoing transfusions. They do almost always, except in rare instances, need to be fully anticoagulated while on the circuit so they don't clot. And so typically, especially with patients on extended ECMO, they will require significant blood product transfusion throughout that course and respiratory therapy to help manage the vent, help wean the vent, because these patients are on a ventilator in addition to having their uh, blood oxygenated um, through the ECMO circuit. The risks of ECMO are certainly significant. These are patients who are extremely sick as well, so that's somewhat of a confounder in some of this data. However, again, just put them on ECMO shouldn't be words that cross your lips. So stroke happens in one out of 10 patients. A third of the patients have a significant hemorrhage uh, requiring transfusion. Most patients have a DVT at some point. A good portion, about one in every seven to eight, will have a PE, and about one in 20 will have limb ischemia that's clinically significant up and in, to including the point of losing a limb. So ECMO is not a benign intervention. It's not a magic bullet. It is not a save all. Um, it is something to be utilized as appropriate, but the potential risks need to be weighed and those discussions had appropriately with our colleagues, as well as with the patient, if they're awake and have those conversations or their loved ones, if they cannot. Again, pregnancy itself, not a reason not to use ECMO. If you have a pregnant patient who needs ECMO, they need ECMO. The pregnancy doesn't change that. The pregnancy may make it more challenging. And the logistics of where to perform ECMO, where to move this patient to cannulate, those things, that discussion has to happen on the front end. And I would say, if you think this patient is getting worse and she's in the ICU and she may need ECMO at some point in the future, having that discussion on the front end, rather than you probably heard the term crash someone onto ECMO, that's not ideal. That's essentially when you're doing a, a, a code and trying to cannulate some for ECMO at the same time. It's extremely challenging. It often does not end well, and that's not a, the perfect situation. If we think a patient may need ECMO, we should be continually evaluating them for that uh, and having those discussions on the front about how we're going to accomplish that in this pregnant patient or this immediately postpartum patient. The delivery timing in relation to ECMO, again, um, a, the cutoff that we felt to give kind of a, a trigger for a discussion, not a trigger for a delivery, was around 32 weeks. So having that discussion around that point in time with our colleagues, because our colleagues in the ICU won't know that. They're not going to come to it of when can we deliver um, with a, a number in mind. They're certainly worried about delivery. They're certainly worried about um, not only mother, but baby or babies doing well too. But they are not going to be the ones who initiate that conversation most of the time. That should be us. And don't feel bad about asking the question, do you think this patient will need ECMO? From the intensivist standpoint, there's not an expectation that people who don't do ICU care are going to know the answers to those questions. Just like we don't expect the ICU team to know how to do a forceps delivery in the ICU if they had to. We all have our areas of expertise and asking each other those questions and asking for that insight is extremely valuable. So if we think the patient will need it, having that discussion with our ICU team and discussing the potential challenges of ECMO cannulation and ECMO ongoing management. And if we do need to deliver the patient on ECMO, how are we going to do that? How's the anticoagulation going to work? Discussing that with anesthesia, all those discussions on the front end while the patient is more stable goes a long, long way and having that plan in place and writing that plan down. And as far as other delivery, if there's immediate life-threatening obstetrical concerns, then delivery is still indicated no matter what. ECMO shouldn't be delayed to accomplish delivery and vice versa as well, depending on the clinical situation. So if a baby is doing exceptionally poor and you think it's related to COVID, but you think the patient needs ECMO too, it should be, which do we need to intervene upon first? Which do we need to correct now 
and then we can do as a second step. These are some indications for ECMO. This is from ELSO, which is kind of the governing body for ECMO oversight, extracorporeal life support organization. I'm not going to belabor these, but if you look at them real quickly, there's a lot of things we talked about. So significant uh, respiratory failure despite optimal ventilation, severe hypercapnia, so retention of CO2 for longer than six hours, prolonged ventilation of less than seven days though. So kind of a, a ECMO can be a benefit for some patients to help them kind of get better and get over the hump over a course of a few days. That's not always the case. Uh, cardiogenic shock that we're not able to fix in other ways. Um, a Murray score, something we utilize in the ICU somewhat uncommonly. ECMO is the majority of the time we use it for. And there's the components of it down there. So you don't need to belabor that. Um, or if you have other things that are single organ failure that have no other comorbidities. So that single organ tends to be cardiac or pulmonary for ECMO. If you have a patient who has a massive PE, ECMO can be utilized for that standpoint as well, or if they need a bridge to transplant or a patient, there's that discussion of crash onto ECMO. That's a patient in cardiac arrest that you believe ECMO may benefit. The delivery timing, I'm just kind of recapping some of this for mild to moderate disease, you know, we're recommending that later, um, you know, portion of pregnancy that early to, you know, uh, early term to full term. Uh, and I think most of us have been able to accomplish that with the vast majority of patients, uh, even if they are still actively infectious within that window at time of delivery. Um, and I don't think we, at least here, we haven't run into a lot of issues with that. Um, I'm hopeful that at your institutions, you haven't seen that as well. We've been able to accomplish that later delivery for mild to moderate disease. The mode of delivery also should be per routine. When we saw in some of the earlier studies looking at COVID, some of the initial cohorts out of China, there was a very high cesarean delivery rate. Um, I think we haven't seen that in our own practice for the most part. Um, and I think it, the, some of the later data didn't support that as well. So I'm reassured by that. Um, so it, the, even sick patients in general, presence of ventilator does not mean absolute indication for C-section. So having those discussions about how will we deliver this patient, what is feasible, um, ECMO can change that uh, based on cannulation site and those sort of things, but have the discussion, don't necessarily make a decision just based on if X, then Y. Severe and critical disease was a little bit more complicated as we discussed and really think these decisions need to be made in a multidisciplinary manner based on maternal status, what their pulmonary disease is currently, what it was, what we think it's going to be around the time of a potential delivery, um, what their level of critical illness is and where we think that will be going in the same regard. If we can wean them from the ventilator and how they're doing on the ventilator and how much support is the ventilator giving them. Again, not something I expect someone who's not an intensivist to be able to look at the machine and know those things. So let's ask those questions. Let's say, hey, is this patient on a lot of support from the ventilator or only a little bit of support from the ventilator? Have we been able to wean this patient at all? Because those are very different patients in the ICU for us and, and very different based on what we think they can tolerate. Um, gestational age obviously becomes a large portion of that discussion. Like I said, in the back of your mind, I think keeping 32 weeks as a trigger point for a discussion, not necessarily a trigger point for a delivery, can be a good um, a mile marker to have. And then shared decision making becomes the crux of this, not only from a multidisciplinary team standpoint, but with the patient or their healthcare proxy if they're not able to make those decisions driving that discussion. We talk about the disease, disease progression can't be protracted. Um, we see that unfortunately for some of our patients. I haven't seen that in too many pregnant patients, but we've seen that as well. Um, worsening maternal status, worsening fetal status, limited or no improvement, all those things have to factor into that discussion as well. Um, what can we accomplish or what do we expect to accomplish with ongoing critical care? It's a discussion we have for our patients in the ICU all the time. It's a discussion we may not be as familiar with on the OB side. So having that discussion with our colleagues to gain that insight can be very beneficial. We have a pregnant patient who's gone on ECMO for a month because her lungs have not been able to recover despite she had COVID a month and a half ago. The chance of recovery from a lung function standpoint needs to be part of that discussion. And unfortunately, it's, it's probably going to be pretty poor. Again, mechanical ventilation, intubation alone, not an indication for delivery in and of itself. And as we said, the use of ECMO, use of other advanced ventilator modes, other adjuncts, feel free to utilize. And then around that 32 week mark is when to have that discussion about what do we think we can accomplish? When should we plan for delivery? How do we coordinate that? Who's gonna be the parties that are involved? This is where we got the information for the 32 weeks from, from um, Dr. Manick and looking at the neonatal mortality. 
is low at 32 weeks and remains low or gets lower past that point in time. And major mor morbidity, all comers, including NICU admission, is still relatively low, just under 9% at 32 weeks and decreases significantly up to less than 2% at 36 weeks. And in this cohort, they didn't study it past 36 weeks. That's where we got 32 weeks as a trigger point for a discussion. Again, I can't stress that enough, a discussion. It's not sick patient with COVID, we get to 32 weeks, we deliver. That's, that's not the algorithm. The algorithm is that if we're at 32 weeks and this patient is sick with COVID, let's discuss our potential planning. Thromboprophylaxis obviously was a big hot topic early on in the pandemic, uh, became a little bit less so. The data is a little bit up and down on some of this in the ICU world right now. However, utilizing whatever institutional guidelines I think is very reasonable. Um, a patient who's going to have a prolonged hospitalization in general should be on anticoagulation. They're going to be in bed for several days. My personal belief is I think a lot of the thrombosis we've seen in some of the studies as well might be related to that prolonged immobility more so than just a COVID phenomenon. Um, there may be an interplay of both those things. I think it's difficult to suss those two out from the data, um, but there's not a contraindication to anticoagulation as we know uh, for our pregnant patients. And that may be something that we help our colleagues on other services understand. If you have a patient who's admitted early prior to viability on the medicine service and they need an anticoagulation because they're gonna be admitted to the hospital, most of the time that will occur, but it may not. So keeping an eye on those sort of things and re reassuring our colleagues, they can utilize that is of paramount importance as well. Aspirin has been, uh, again, you know, something from preeclampsia prevention standpoint, but utilized um, with patients on anticoagulation as well, that's fine. Still utilizing it for the obstetrical indications is what we've been doing in our practice, and that's what I would support in addition. Looking at the pregnancy outcomes in general, this was back in July of, of last year, uh, and for a while was kind of one of the more comprehensive reviews of the case series and reports that were out there. And there's uh, 324 pregnancies and nine maternal deaths, four fetal neonatal deaths. And you can see there's a significant complication rate of preterm birth of three out of four, cesarean delivery, almost 80%. Um, and more than half of those, the indication for cesarean delivery was COVID-19 and about 28% excuse me, 28% of um, neonates went to the NICU. Again, a lot of this was based on earlier reports and earlier cohorts from China and from the initial outbreaks there. Um, and a lot of the interventions were iatrogenic, iatrogenic cesarean delivery, iatrogenic preterm birth. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying that's something we have to have a, in the back of our minds when we're interpreting some of this data. But for a while, when I gave this talk many months ago, this was the long-standing kind of how does this affect pregnancy um, data that I think we could go to with the strongest evidence. Since then, and especially in the last few months, we've had more analyses. We've had kind of reviews of the reviews. Um, this is one from Jafari et al. from January of 2021 and looks at some of the effects in a meta-analysis standpoint on that Left side, you have figure two, which is the cesarean delivery in COVID-19 versus um, COVID-19 non-pregnant controls. You can, say there, you can see there is an increased chance for cesarean delivery in their review of the studies. And they have um, 6,400 and 12,000 patients in the cases and controls. On the right, you have also low birth weight and shows an increased low birth weight for patients that were exposed to COVID-19 as well. And that does comport with some of the things, the things we were seeing in those older um, cohorts, but has been borne out when we combine them as well. So an increased risk for cesarean delivery may be true and an increased risk for low birth weight may be true. However, from Navo et al, also from February, January and February of this year, 2021, the forest plot on the left looks at pneumonia findings on chest CT and actually favors pregnant patients. They have less pneumonia seen on CT as compared to non-pregnant control. So that's an interesting thing that seems to say, from an imaging standpoint at least, pregnant patients appear better than non-pregnant matched controls. So interesting. Um, uh, so not necessarily that they're definitely going to have worse outcomes or definitely going to have worse findings. Actually, for pneumonia, that may be the opposite. Premature delivery, again, um, significant or nearly significant. Fetal distress, no difference. Neonatal asphyxia, no difference. And low birth weight in this review as well found a um, trend or sorry, a trend to significance for low birth weight. 
which is similar and also based on a lot of the same studies. I think this is a very interesting look and I, I applaud Bellos, Pandita and Rafaela to look at this. Um, basically kind of shows a publication bias for some of this information that we're utilizing in these reviews to look at pregnancy outcomes. And that's the challenge. Um, it's a challenge in all patients with COVID because we tend to write about and report the patients who have the bad outcomes. So they looked at 16 observational studies and 44 case series and reports, 160 almost total patients. And what you see on the graph there is the incidence of various outcomes based on either case reports in the kind of pink salmon colored line or observational cohort studies in the kind of teal chartreuse, not sure what color that is, uh, graph there. And as you see in general, the observational studies tend to report those outcomes less than the case series and case reports do, which makes sense when you think about it. Um, and that does coincide, not necessarily proves, but coincides with a potential publication bias. So we have to take that grain of salt, that some of the things that have been reported from do pregnant patients do worse, do they have a higher risk of adverse outcomes. I think it's less clear because a lot of the things that have been published and a lot of things that then have been cultivated within those analyses may have significant publication bias to them and, and over-reporting of those bad events. Vaccination, I'll throw in my two cents, wholly support it. Dr. Vought and I both personally have both been vaccinated. Um, and we, when we wrote this, it was right before SMFM came out with a separate line about vaccination. Um, and we echo that as well through our wholehearted support behind it, um, in addition to ACOG as well as ASR, um, yeah, ASRM. And many, many, many governing bodies have come out. And I would encourage all of you, I'm sure everyone here probably has been vaccinated. If not, I hope you get vaccinated soon. And I would encourage all of us to encourage everyone else that we care about and that they care about to get vaccinated, because I truly do believe that's how we get past the mainstay of the harms of COVID. So a little bit a feel, but just kind of in general, how do we recognize the critically ill patient? Because I think this is one of the most important things from a critical illness standpoint, whether you're an intensivist or an MFM, you're an obstetrician or any specialty. Is there a way to reliably find this patient? We've asked this question in the critical care world a lot. The problem in pregnancy, there's a lot of overlap between a sick abnormal findings and an otherwise non-pregnant patient and pregnancy physiology, as we all know. And part of that discussion with our, our colleagues on medicine or in the ICU is, is helping everyone understand that. Additionally, our patients tend to be young and healthy, in quotes, most of the time, even if they do have hypertension, diabetes, some other diseases, they tend to be doing well and are able to compensate for a long period of time until they have a physiological collapse. So they're kind of chugging along and doing okay until they fall off a cliff. That's a big concern for anyone who's young and healthy otherwise, and we need to be very cognizant of that. Um, but thankfully, less than 2% of all pregnancies require ICU mission, but it's still a decent number. So anywhere from one to almost 14 cases per 1,000 deliveries. So it's not rare. There'll be a quiz on this, so memorize all this. No, I'm, I'm kidding. So this is looking at different screening tools just from an approach to how do we assess if somebody's sick and will they need critical care? Do they have increased risk for harm, increased risk for mortality? Don't need to belabor this. I just put this here because it's showing you there's a lot. We've been looking at this and asking this question in the ICU world for decades now. None of them are fantastic. Some of them are very onerous and that's why we don't use them. Some of them are great, and quick and easy. The bets I like the QSOFA. I'm just a simple country doctor, as I like to say. And so I like to keep things simple. Um, the QSOFA has three components. I think that's easy enough for me to remember. These are some more pregnancy specific ones. You have the cipher score at top. You have the WHO criteria, maternal severity index the obstetric early warning score, maternal mortality score, and there's some others as well, um, SOS, all of which have tried to look at different ways that we can say, is a pregnant or postpartum patient sick? Is she going to get more sick? Does she need to go to the ICU? Does she have an increased risk of mortality? And the maternal or early warning criteria, and this is from the um, ACOG uh, practice bulletin, uh, has a number of different components it looks at as well. Systolic and diastolic blood pressures, as you see, either low or high for systolic, high for diastolic. I put MAP in there with an asterisk because it's not part of the other criteria. But typically in the ICU, we'll, if a MAP is less than 65, that's a certainly a warning sign for us and consistent with shock. And we have to figure out why and, and fix that underlying reason. So it's not part of the actual criteria that are listed from maternal early warning. However, tends to correlate with a low systolic uh, blood pressure and low diastolic blood pressure. If the heart rate is low or high, the respiratory rate also low or high, if the oxygen saturation is less than 95%. Um, we 
use a different cutoff in the ICU sometimes with ARDSNET protocol, the goal is actually about 88% um, for a ventilated patient. So it's a little bit different. So you may hear different numbers. It doesn't mean one's right or wrong, but it does become incumbent on us discussing with our intensivist colleagues that from a maternal standpoint, our goal is 95 most of the time and above. Uh, oliguria, which we've all you know, been familiar with, we prefer greater than two hours, less than 35 mLs an hour. Uh, and then more of the mental status things, agitation, confusion, unresponsiveness. We need to make sure these things are not due to medication. So this patient didn't get two milligrams of Dilaudid and now that's why they're unresponsive. Um, having that discussion with our nursing colleagues at the bedside to understand what medicines were given and when. Having that discussion with anesthesiology to, to have the same questions answered or also to educate us about this patient was given this medicine, do I expect this effect to still be ongoing? This is looking at the QSOFA and the SOFA score. And I will tell you anecdotally, this is kind of how I approach a lot of patients, um, both from a pregnancy MFM standpoint, as well as from an ICU assessment standpoint, and looking at them saying, are they breathing fast? Are they awake alert and oriented and making sense? And what's their blood pressure looking like? It's a very quick, easy way to say, do I think this patient is getting sicker acutely? Might they be getting sicker? What are the things I may need to do for them? So I would advocate keeping QSOF in the back of your mind. Again, hasn't been validated in pregnant patients robustly. However, it's not a huge stretch of imagination to say that it may not apply, uh, especially from a respiratory rate, mental status standpoint. Uh, additionally, and systolic blood pressure can be a little bit of an overlap in pregnant patients as we know, especially pregnant patients um, who have no history of hypertension or are more petite, keeping that in the back of my mind. But if a patient is confused and you don't have another good reason for it, or they're breathing quickly, you don't have another good reason for it, Worrying about this patient's sick, particularly from a COVID standpoint, is of significant importance. And the full SOFA score has some more uh, parameters to it that can be a little bit more labor intensive. Um, and it's not that it can't be done, but it's typically not done immediately at the bedside. Putting all these things together, looking at receiver operator curves, and you guys probably know a perfect receiver operator curve is going to have the um, kind of the crux of the parabola towards the top left. It's going to have the largest area under the curve. All of these are decent, as you see from the curvature. None of these are great, I would say. So all in that like 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, 0 0.85 range. So they're, they're pretty good for a lot of things, but none of them are perfect. The top left is the Cypher score in obstetric patients. Um, the top right is a comparison of several different scores, Apache, one and, uh, Apache 2 and 4, um, SAP and SOFA. Um, and that is for maternal outcomes as well. And you see those all perform pretty similarly. And then the bottom is also looking at number of different scores as well as um, Glasgow Coma Scale, so mental status by itself, as well as a novel um, protein, this presepsin that these authors were looking at. And all of those also perform similarly. So the, the short of it, and that the last one in the middle is not pregnant patients, that's ICU patients in general. The long and short of it is that these tests are pretty good at saying who isn't sick similar to how an NST is very good at saying who doesn't need intervention or what babies are not sick. None of them are that great at really telling you, especially in the pregnant population, because your pretest probability is low of who is really sick and really needs to go to the ICU. So there's some subjectivity to that. And there's some subject subjectivity on our end as intensivists to assess a patient and say, do they need to come to the ICU or not? And that gets us back to this algorithm for triaging for severity. We made this for COVID-19 patients. I would say it was written in such a way a lot of it can be extrapolated to non-COVID-19 patients from a clinical status standpoint, from an assessment standpoint, from a call for consultation standpoint. This is the end of the algorithm, which I would want to stress to you that area on the right. Above this, the yes, no branch point is basically, is this patient needing intervention? Is this patient getting sick? If the answer is no, okay, you're, they're doing great. Let's keep doing what we're doing and keep reassessing them. The answer is yes to any of those things. You see the first line there, consult intensivist or critical care. Have no qualms of doing that, please. As an intensivist, I would much rather receive 10 phone calls of, hey, I'd like you to take a look at this patient rather than, hey, we're coding this patient. Okay, so always keep that in mind. Always you know, reach out if you have any questions. Here at our institution, we have a central intensivist and that is their job is to triage these patients for who may need to come to the ICU. Um, and assessing them and what levels of care they may need and what things we can do on what floor and what unit for that exact reason. Okay, so call an intensivist, call a uh, console, call whomever you feel may be helpful for this patient. So I think that may be the, the scoring system, um, maybe the Hallscott scoring system, jokingly. Uh, if you think this patient needs help, okay, if you think they're sick or you think they're soon going to be sick, 
and may need services that can only be provided in the ICU? The answer is yes, call the intensivist. The answer is, I think so, they might, maybe, call the intensivist. If the answer is an emphatic no, then you can keep doing what you're doing, keep a close eye on the patient. And whenever you get to a maybe or a yes, then call the intensivist. And again, completely and perfectly okay to ask for help. None of us are an expert in everything. I don't know if I'm an expert in anything, okay? But I know to call people who are experts when I need that help. And I do that in the ICU all the time. I call tons of colleagues to help me take care of patients every time I'm on call in the ICU. Same thing goes in the MFM world. If I have something that is not in my in the personal area of expertise, I'm happy to involve my colleagues who know more than me and take care of those things. And that is their personal area of expertise. And I would strongly encourage all of us to always do that. So then I think we're able to do that with a few minutes left. I appreciate you guys listening. Um, my email is there. Feel free to reach out with any questions. Uh, I will try my best to follow up with those. And I said, stay safe, stay strong, keep up the good work. And as a good friend of mine says, every day is a school day. So thank you all and look forward to any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm going to try to move forward with some of the questions real quick because we're um, running a little short on time. Um, this was one that came a little bit early. Does ox oxygen supplementation or vasodilation enhance um, viral replication? So that's a great question, and I will demonstrate what I don't know here. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that the data says on that. Um, it's an interesting question. I think um, knowing that may not change clinical management, however, though, because if I have a patient who's sick and we do have some evidence that greater viral load correlates with greater clinical sickness. So if I have a patient who's requiring significant clinical intervention, needing intubation, needing an escalation of care, I'm presuming their viral load is probably pretty high. Um, that doesn't change what I would do for them. I wouldn't, you know, modify that. Um, so it's an interesting academic question. Um, and I personally, I, I would like the academic answer. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I think I would still treat them clinically based on what I see. Perfect. And then um, a question that I think we've all been struggling with on this vaccination. So um, what is your opinion on first trimester COVID vaccine administration? I know you gave a, a really good, robust response and um, talk about that, but can you just kind of give your own personal opinion with what you see on first trimester? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so my personal opinion, um, speaking for myself, is that I think you should get the vaccine as soon as you can. Uh, regardless of what trimester you're in, uh, there's not any evidence that, you know, I believe exists that there's uh, increased risk, you know, um, from a two a pregnancy standpoint. I definitely know there's increased risk of getting COVID, whether you're pregnant or not. So that's the risk benefits to discuss. Um, definitely had the discussions with some of my patients um, who have, you know, been pregnant during this time. And a lot of our colleagues, you know, that work here and have access to the vaccine and we take care of them for their pregnancies. Um, I've had patients opt to get it in the first trimester. I fully support that. I've had patients opt to wait till the end of the first trimester. We've had the discussions about the risks and benefits of that are, but I would say uh, as soon as anyone can get the vaccine and whichever vaccine that is available, because they've all been uh, under emergency authorization, uh, I would suggest getting and I would support that. Perfect, I'm gonna combine two of these um, so that I can let you answer both. Mm -hmm. um, the what fetal surveillance do you um, do for a pregnant patient with history of COVID and then kind of in that same venue, what do you think about the use of aspirin in an outpatient setting for mild to moderate COVID to decrease the risk of VTE? So kind of what do mm -hmm. we do with these, sure. yeah, <laughs> yeah. these, these non-ICU COVID people? Sure, sure. It's, good. it's a very good question and also common questions. Um, so we are not doing anything different from a surveillance standpoint currently. And I think a lot of places are also not doing that difference because like I said, the data, it's a little bit muddy still, I think. You know, that publication bias for a lot of it, I think we'll get better data later on. And I think you know we'll get more information to say, what are those real risks Do they exist? Um, I don't know that we have robust enough information to then change practice for people currently. Um, that being said too, I think if, if institutions are utilizing that, I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, but personally, we are not doing that. Um, and I have an advocate for that for patients as well. I think the data still needs to be fully codified to understand that. Um, and I think with an aspirin standpoint is a similar kind of response. You know, aspirin has been for a while, we thought from cardiovascular risk, it was a good thing. And now some of the data says maybe it's not as beneficial as we thought. And that's kind of the ongoing debate in the cardiology world. We utilize it for a prophylactic standpoint from stroke recurrence. Um, but from a COVID, I don't think we know enough, um, you know, uh, from a risk of VTE, I think. The risk of low dose aspirin is very small. I think from a peace of mind standpoint, if I have a very uh, invested patient who really wanted to do it, um, 
you know, it's, uh, I can't say there's a benefit. I would also say I don't think that there's a significant harm to that. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't have the data to stand on to say that I think it's indicated for those patients yet. Um, we can go over a few minutes. I just got, um, hopefully you can go over a few minutes as well. I got word from SMFM. They'll continue. Um, I just want to answer a few more questions. Sure. Have you had any experience with monolucast? Um, not, not starting it for a COVID patient, whether pregnant or not. Um, uh, you know, I've had some asthmatic patients have been taking it and, uh, you know, they continue it. Um, so I think it's reasonable for patients on it. Um, I think it's, it may be something that if it wants to be added as an adjunct, I think it is reasonable. I don't know that it will, um, you know, give a significant benefit. We're definitely with our um, admitted to the ICU or intermediate level care patients. Often they're getting other breathing treatments consistently um, and chest physiotherapy and lots of things to kind of help in a multimodal fashion from a ventilation standpoint. So I think from that regard, it's reasonable, um, but we haven't been utilizing it as a common uh, medication for these patients. Tori, I think this is really time sensitive. There's a question about the J&J &J vaccine, um, the fact that it's an adenovirus vector, um, and it, it is a different, you know, vaccine than the other two that we're, we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, can you just give, and I know this is your personal opinion, and just because this is an SMFM lecture, I want to be very clear that this is, but it's a very important personal opinion. Can you give just a little bit of background and, and an answer to that as to what we think at the moment um, about the J&J? Sure, sure, absolutely. And I think it's a great question, um, and I will I appreciate that, uh, you know, preemptive, and, I, and I'll put my own there too as well. I'm not a vaccine expert per se, um, but my understanding of the virus is that um, the adenovirus vector is inactivated to the point that it cannot replicate, it cannot cause, you know, the, so it's just a delivery mechanism. My understanding, again, insofar as similar to how the mRNA vaccines have a delivery mechanism of, of a lipid particle that they're suspended in. So if that's the case, and if it's just a delivery mechanism, I wouldn't anticipate any sort of adverse interaction with that. Um, but I said, I'm saying that not as an absolute expert in that mechanism for this vaccine. Um, and it's a good question you know, to have. And I th but I think the nice thing about having three vaccines that are available is that if a pregnant patient has the opportunity to get a vaccine and wants to get a vaccine, I think it's reasonable to have that discussion with the provider and say, hey, can I get the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine if those are available to me? Because at least from a mechanistic theoretical standpoint, there should be no, it precludes that discussion. Um, you know, and, and I think we'll get more and more information. I believe I saw something the other day about um, Johnson Johnson was looking at going to include pregnant patients and in ongoing surveillance, ongoing, you know, trial and study. So I think as you get that more information, that'll be good. And I'm cautiously optimistic, um, but I think it's reasonable to have that discussion. And I saw some of their stuff was actually looking at later. Interesting that first trimester conversation happened, the J&J &J vaccine, it seemed yeah. as though they were going to be recruiting later. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I haven't seen data myself on when that would start as well. But, yeah, exactly. but I think from a standpoint of what we know, we know more about the other two at the moment and exactly. agreed. So um, there's a little question about, and we talked a little bit about this, but it, are they recommending, is your institution or you recommending any prophylactic anticoagulation after an asymptomatic COVID patient comes in for delivery? So kind of the postpartum setting. Yeah. Similar to what we talked about, but now postpartum. Yeah, um, I think not from a COVID, strictly COVID alone standpoint. I think if they have other risk factors, um, you know, they're going to have senior immobility, you know, the kind of the traditional things that would put them at increased risk for, you know, thromboembolism than having that discussion. Um, prophylactic anticoagulation doesn't seem to have significant adverse events. So I think that discussion can be had. I would always caution using intermediate or full dose anticoagulation, having a real reason to do that, I think is important because there are some risks with that, it seems in, in the data, but strictly from a COVID standpoint, if someone comes in and they're an asymptomatic, had a, a normal vaginal delivery, uncomplicated, they're up and about the next day, those patients were not anticoagulating. Um, there's a question, I'm not sure exactly if I understand the question, why antibody is raised in baby after vaccination. Um, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I see that as well. Um, and, and potentially what they were talking about, um, maybe antibody levels that are, you know, crossing the placenta. And there's been a little bit of data looking at that, actually probably a decent amount of data, um, kind of in various approaches. And it seems that there are antibodies that do cross. Um, and most of those have been from natural infections that's been shown. I don't know of anything post-vaccine that's been published yet. Um, but for some reason, it seems those antibodies don't cross as readily as some other, 
um, a viral infection. So it, it's interesting, but there does seem to be some protection that can cross from an antibody standpoint. Um, and luckily, I think as we've seen, not only anecdotally, but in a lot of the data, there doesn't seem to be true significant increased risk of vertical transmission, nor of a lot of neonates getting sick post-delivery, thankfully. Okay, and then I guess I've got the last question, although I didn't hop over to the chat, but we were trying to do at least from the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, some of my partners are advocating cooling off COVID patients for the seven days prior to delivery. What are your thoughts about this? And is there data to support this? Because I've found yeah, none. Yeah, this, yeah. this is interesting too, because this, this was an earlier thought, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and I think, um, I'm not entirely certain what the, the question means about cooling off, but um, I think taking in mind what that clinical status is, um, where they're at, um, and I think if they're critically ill, severely ill, that may be part of the discussion. I would say, do we think we can optimize them a few more days from now better than where they're at now? I think that's reasonable to have that discussion. If you think they're going to be stable in a severe or critically ill standpoint, then I think that that cooling off doesn't necessarily um, you know, do anything uh, at least from an evidence-based standpoint that I can suggest, but certainly, you know, the, the regular measures, PPE, having all those things in place, you know, that makes sense. But I think from just, just a, if they have COVID, I want to wait a certain amount of time to deliver them. I, I don't have evidence to stand on this as that's beneficial or harmful, you know. And I'm going to grab from the chat. There's one last question, so I will take it if you have a couple seconds. Sure. Um, approximately how many pregnancies actually occur during the COVID trials? This person wasn't able to find kind of an exact number. Is the CDC analyzing data as it's coming in through the vSafe um, cdc.gov and then other incoming um, unvaccinated pregnant patients? I think mm -hmm. this is all coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think a lot of that data hopefully will be forthcoming shortly. Um, yeah, I don't know um, from the various trials, you know, I don't think they broke pregnant patients out yet. I think that's uh, that's going to be ideally maybe in the next few weeks, maybe next few months and kind of get it. And I, same thing with the CDC and the VAERS data um, that will be coming anecdotally. Um, you know, I haven't heard, you know, from our colleagues around the country of people having significant adverse events during pregnancy after the vaccine. Um, and we haven't seen that here as well. So I'm cautiously reassured by that, uh, but I think we have to a little more time before we get that answer more robustly. Yeah, I do know that VSAFE came out with this little PowerPoint slide where they looked at baseline risk versus vaccinated risk, but all of this stuff is yeah. coming and I think is um, early and I, I am hoping we get data soon as well. I, you know, Agreed. Agreed. But I know they're looking at it, so yeah. I appreciate um, all of that. Yeah. So I think with that, we're going to thank you for your expertise and your time and your care to your patients. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I hope you have a good day. Thank you. You All too. Right, take thanks. care. Take care.